Good evening. We're going to get started. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming to tonight's program. Uh, my name is Erin Pettigrew, and I teach in the History and Arab Crossroads Studies programs here at NYU Abu Dhabi. And this evening's talk by Professor Carl Ernst is part of a larger two-day workshop, the first part of which took place today and the second part tomorrow, in which my co-organizers, Scott Reese from Northern Arizona University and Taryn Jetsavia from University of Pennsylvania, and I invited scholars working in Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia to come together to discuss what we've called the Islamic multiverse and histories of everyday social discourse. The workshop is exploring the unseen and how it constitutes a very important part of the social fabric informing aspects of social and political life for many Muslims across time and space in various social and cultural contexts. The causes of illness, both physical and metaphysical, are commonly sought among spirits and other multidimensional beings. Similarly, solutions to the problems of everyday life, social anxieties, illnesses, insecurity, desires for li better livelihoods, are often sought by invoking the power of invisible forces. The workshop then is asking questions of how scholars can address the material and immaterial functions of spirits, and specifically, how do historians tra uh, track change over time when it comes to ephemeral and invisible spirits and forces. The workshop and tonight's public lecture have been supported by the Institute at NYU Abu Dhabi, and they wouldn't have happened, um, it wouldn't have happened without the important help of its staff, Gila, Nora, and Manal, my colleagues in the humanities, and then others I'm, I'm sure I'm neglecting to name. We're lucky enough tonight to have Professor Carl Ernst, the William Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill with us as our keynote speaker for the workshop. Professor Ernst also co-directs the Carolina Center for the Study of the Middle East and Muslim Civilizations, and he co-edits the Islamic Civilization and Muslim Network series for the University of North Carolina Press. His regional area of expertise has been West and South Asia, where he has relied on texts in Arabic, Persian, and Urdu for his research on Sufism, Indo-Muslim culture, and more recently, Islamophobia, problems in understanding Islam, the problem of reading the Quran, and rethinking Islamic studies. He is currently working on a translation of the 10th century Sufi, al halaj and a project, he has a project on Muslim interpretations of Indian religion and yoga. And in this vein, he's also collaborating on a Persian Indica project, which focuses on Persian translations of Sanskrit texts and Persian writings on Indian sciences and cultures. Finally, he's received multiple awards, including the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Fellowship, and awards for his books, Following Mohammed, Rethinking Islam in the Contemporary World, which has been translated into at least six other languages, and Rusbihan Bakli, Mystical Experience and the Rhetoric of Sainthood in Persian Sufism. His most recent book, which just has um, appeared in the last year, is called Refractions of Islam in India, Situating Sufism and Yoga. Please join me in welcoming Professor Carl Ernst to NYU Abu Dhabi as he speaks with us about religion or science, how early Muslim thinkers understood the hidden worlds. Thank you very much for a generous welcome. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, the remarks I'm making tonight are, in a way, contextualizing the conference which is going on uh, today and tomorrow, and uh, perhaps explaining to you why it is that we are devoting our time to subjects which some people would consider to be irrelevant, superstitious, and not worthy of our time. So uh, let me begin by just uh, talking about what I'm going to try to cover. 
and I'm going to start with uh, some observations about the concepts of science, religion, and the hidden or the occult. That's the Greek uh, term uh, for this concept of the, the worlds that are beyond our knowledge. And then I'm going to look at two different classifications of the hidden that are found by eminent Muslim scholars, one of them Ibn Khaldun, the great Arab scholar of North Africa in the 14th century, and the other one, a Persian named Al-Amuli from the same time, who came to very different uh, conclusions in their attempt to classify the, uh, the hidden sciences. Ibn Khaldun referred to them as a subset of prophecy, while Amoli talked about them as part of the natural sciences. I find this to be an interesting divergence, and I want to ask some questions about why it would be they would come to such different conclusions, and I'll have a couple of suggestions which have to do with the different roles of reason and the consequences of those ideas. So to begin with, this is covering an awful lot of uh, intellectual history, but I think we need to go back to uh, the Greeks, to Plato and Aristotle, and their reflections on the beginning of philosophy, which starts in wonder. And they both decided that it was the wonder at the stars above us and the ever-flowing being within that leads us to question and understand the truths of nature and reason and the soul. This is interestingly echoed by the Quran in which, in which God declares that we shall show them our signs on the horizons and in their souls, which poses again the question of how do we connect the, the world of nature to the internal experiences of the human soul, nature and consciousness. What is the connection between them? This is a fundamental problem in understanding what it means to be human. Now, Muslims inherited these problems when multi-religious teams of scholars under the sponsorship of the Abbasid Caliphate translated substantial portions of the Greek scientific and philosophical tradition into Arabic. This translation movement was not limited to purely material concerns, and Muslim reflections on theology and prophecy, both of which are words which we get from the Greek, are inseparable from the encounter with Greek thought. And likewise, Islamic art, calligraphy, and architecture, particularly in geometry, necessarily include a mathematical dimension reflecting the Pythagorean view of the harmonious cosmos, the music of the spheres. And there was more. Astronomy was part of astrology, Alchemy was indistinguishable from chemistry, and numerology and other occult subjects were extremely popular. Now, if we move to the time of the European Enlightenment, this on the one hand was a time in which uh, magic and miracles went decidedly out of fashion. And under the criticism of philosophers like David Hume, the notion that miracles and magic were real became widely discredited. And more recently, in what is called the New Atheism, we have thinkers advocating the entire rejection of religion as nonsense. But more broadly, in the growth of the study of global civilization in the 19th and 20th centuries, the key terms that emerged from this exploration were science, religion, and a third that was questionable was magic, or the entire ensemble of the occult and hidden realm. In practice, it was difficult for scholars to draw the line between these categories. And if you look at the history of the uh, early scholarship on, on religion, the difference between religion, science, and magic is very difficult to pinpoint with an exactitude that everyone would agree with. Now, today we're used to a hierarchy of knowledge 
in which the natural sciences and mathematics and their practical applications are supreme. The softer social sciences, ranging from anthropology and sociology to political science and economics, lean on quantitative data to claim legitimacy as a science. Humanities and the arts are sometimes left to losers. And in many countries, there's an early tracking of students into these different fields. And I think that you're aware of the way in which these are generally ranked. And uh, we have a lot of students who show up in my university who are under instructions from their parents not to major in anything questionable that might lead to a lack of a job, which is understandable. Yet at the same time, as science reigns supreme, there is significant opposition to the scientific consensus on matters like climate change and evolution from quarters that are often associated with conservative religious teachings. This is especially common among groups who distrust what they see as arrogant condescension among academic and political elites. And how many of us are really able to evaluate the theories of modern science? A recent uh, experiment asked people if they could explain the mechanics of the ordinary zipper, which turns out to be pretty much beyond the powers of most of us. The relationship between science and the miraculous is interesting, however. I think most people are aware that the Catholic Church still canonizes saints on the basis of the performance of miracles, which have to be attested by outside experts. I have a colleague whose father-in-law is a physician. He's not a religious man, he's an agnostic. But he's called upon by the Catholic Church to evaluate cases of miraculous healing. And his testimony as a non-religious scientist is deemed to be necessary for the authentication of a miracle. Now, uh, let me just quickly talk about the study of the occult sciences or the hidden realm in modern scholarship. It turns out that this is an important subject and there's been a lot of uh, valuable research that has been produced among scholars. Uh, and I think back to uh, a woman named Frances Yates who wrote some very interesting and important books about, uh, for instance, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic uh, tradition and the art of memory and a number of other uh, really insightful books about the, the important role of the occult sciences in the Elizabethan world, for instance, or in uh, Italy in the Renaissance. So uh, we take these seriously as subjects, not because we're planning to introduce a department of numerology or alchemy into the curriculum, but because these were important in the societies whose history we inherit. So there is a history of uh, scholarship that has been performed by specialists in Islamic thought, uh, ranging from an early colonial anthropology looking at magic and superstition to more recent studies about the history of ideas, the history of science, the history of religion, all of which are intertwined. And the same people were involved in all of these fields simultaneously. That is to say, the great thinkers of the 17th century were oftentimes scientists, theologians, and occultists at the same time. Now, um, I want to briefly allude to debates among Muslims over the relationship between reason and revelation. Obviously, this is one of the very biggest problems uh, in the history of uh, civilization. And it's not something on which there is any easy answer. Uh, Today, you'll oftentimes hear the idea that science was once great among the Arabs, but it was uh, retarded or perhaps even defeated by the ascendancy of theology. And people will say, well, Al-Ghazali is responsible for killing science. I think that's uh, a misinformed perspective. 
and uh, it confuses issues of science and technology. The uh, conquests of European colonialism were made possible by advanced military technology, not scientific theory. Um, but the role of reason was very central in uh, establishing theological schools over the centuries. I won't try to enumerate all of the debates. It's a complex subject in the history of Islamic thought. Uh, you have some schools who emphasize reason as being central and others who uh, put it into a very secondary position. Uh, but it's never absent. And even in the schools which are deemed to be anti-rationalistic uh, like the Hanbali uh, school of law, the, the concept of the necessity of reason to establish a point like the existence of God or the necessity of prophecy was widely accepted and, and used by scholars. It was not simply a matter of asserting authority. We can come back to that in the question period. So uh, what I'm gonna argue is that there are different classifications of the sciences, not for purely rational reasons, but because of larger purposes and agendas. And I think these are best uh, ascertained by examining the kind of overall literary structure of the work and the uh, sort of political and theological project of the author. So let's begin with Ibn Khaldun. And I may be going out on a limb here, and there are some scholars present who might, uh, who definitely might uh, have some questions for me, which is good. So uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, who was very prominent in North Africa in the 14th century. I just want to place, show you where the writings are that we're talking about. There are three major works that he has, which form a kind of a sequence. First, the Muqaddama, or the introduction, which he called the introduction to history, in which he proposed to establish a new scientific approach to history, which would understand the causes of events. And this is a big project. He's sometimes called the founder of sociology. This was a preface, and it's an enormous work in itself. Uh, in the English translation, it's about 1,200 pages. Um, then it was a preface to a th large history of the dynasties of, of North Africa called the Kitab al-Ibar, the Book of Admonitions. And then he has a supplement which is autobiographical, and it's uh, about his journey from North Africa to uh, the East. He went to Egypt and eventually had some adventures uh, there before he passed away. Now the Muqaddama is a very ambitious work and uh, I'm just giving you the outline so you can see how big it is. I'm gonna refer to a couple of sections from chapter one or book one and book six. Uh, and this is where we get, uh, for instance, from book one, he has six preliminary discourses and the last one is about the knowledge of the hidden before he gets into the heart of the book on civilization. Then in the uh, sixth book, which is a survey of the sciences, he talks about what he calls the traditional and the intellectual sciences. And we'll see where he, he fits in a few of the occult sciences into that section. So, as I said, in book one, there are six prefaces and most of them are about subjects. The first one being about civilization, authority, and prophecy. Then he talks about ge geographic and climatic affairs, human behavior, diet. And then in the last section, number six, he talks about those individuals who either by nature or by uh, uh, assiduous efforts have attained unusual knowledge of uh, the beyond. And this ranges from prophets to uh, other varieties of people. And so then in the sixth preface, yeah, yeah, this is the sixth preface. These are the types of things which he discusses in this section. It's about 45 pages in the Arabic text. So it begins with prophecy and then it includes other things like soothsaying, dreams, uh, forms of divination, uh, supernatural perception, and then f kinds of prognostication and, and uh, divination, which are quite very complicated uh, which have to do in some cases with uh, 
the letters of the alphabet, and uh, you had to go to a professional to get this kind of thing done. Then, in the chapter six, he, he has an outline of what he calls the traditional sciences, and, and let's take a look at what this is involved. Uh, he begins with the Quranic sciences and the prophetic traditions and Islamic law and, and jurisprudence. Then he moves on to theology and Sufism, which he highlights as an important Islamic science, and concludes it with dream interpretation. These are the sciences that are sanctioned by religion and tradition. They have the, uh, the seal of authority, as it were. And out of these, you might say that Sufism and dream interpretation perhaps have, they, they might surprise you, you know, to say uh, that these are central to uh, his view of what is Islamic tradition. Because they've become contested in today's climate of opinion. But they were clearly central for, for Ibn Khaldun. Then he moves on to the intellectual sciences. Now, this does not begin with a surprising array of topics. He starts with the um, mathematical quartet, the quadrivium of uh, arithmetic, geometry, optics, and astronomy. He moves on to logic, physics, medicine, agriculture, and metaphysics. But then he has some other stuff in there which you might not find in your um, department of physics or biology today namely sorcery and talismans, the evil eye, secrets of letters, a technique known as the Zayaraja, and alchemy. Then he pauses to say what's wrong with all of these, and he has a refutation of philosophy where he tells you where the philosophers are wrong. And then, rather uh, unusually for his time, he refutes both astrology and alchemy as fraudulent enterprises, which need to be rejected. He does this on religious and ethical grounds. Now, um, I want to pause for a moment to ask a question about this arrangement, because I'm not entirely convinced of his sincerity in parts of this. His rejection of philosophy in particular, I find a little bit surprising. During his early career in North Africa, he spent years looking for a new Alexander to whom he could be Aristotle. Uh, Professor Mohsen Mahdi in his book on Ibn Khaldun's political philosophy highlights the way in which uh, Ibn Khaldun went from uh, one place to another as a political uh, seeker, and in Fez, in Granada, and in Bougie, he attempted to work, with, work for rulers who he saw as potentially great world emperors. And he tried to teach philosophy to Muhammad V of Granada, a man who became a very cruel tyrant and ended up murdering his prime minister the philosopher Ibn al-Khatib. Uh, this was a disaster for uh, Ibn Khaldun. He doesn't even talk about it in his autobiography. But uh, his dedication to philosophy was very deep at the time. His explanations of prophecy are filled with philosophical terminology. He was trained in the Aristotelian tradition. He knew it intimately. He knew the works of Ibn Rushd and uh, many other of the philosophers of the West and the East. And yet he tells you that you shouldn't read their works. Their conclusions are irrelevant to being a good Muslim. And then he moves on. This is done with, I think, uh, I, I'm raising a question about the, the degree to which he actually believes this. And this is in part because we know that his predecessor, Ibn Rushd, argued that, for instance, in understanding the interpretation of the Quran, 
the ordinary people should understand it on one level, and the philosophers should understand it on a different level. And again, according to Ibn Rushd, the ordinary people who are not qualified to understand philosophy should not be exposed to it. And I also turn to his uh, uh, near contemporary, also trained in Cordova, that is, that is uh, Moses Maimonides, who wrote a book called The Guide to the Perplex. He wrote it in Arabic, uh, although it was called Judeo-Arabic because it was uh, written in the Hebrew alphabet. But he tells us uh, something very interesting in the introduction to his Guide for the Perplexed. This is his list of seven reasons why authors are inconsistent in their writings. Now, some of these are stupid reasons, like you forgot or you changed your mind or something like that. But numbers five and seven, Maimonides says, are reasons why he is inconsistent in his writings. Sometimes you have to change according to the capacity of your audience and write in a particular way that's suitable for them. And you need to conceal philosophical metaphysics from those who are unworthy of it. So it seems to me that there's some reasons to entertain the idea that Ibn Khaldun, writing for a particular audience with his Muqaddimah, or Introduction to History, was willing to reject philosophy out of hand for that audience, but he might have had a different position for others who were more qualified. And uh, one has to recall that Ibn Rushd was exiled and his books were burned publicly uh, in Andalus because of the uh, unpopularity of philosophical teachings. And this is discussed by uh, Leo Strauss in his book called Persecution and the Art of Writing. And it's also telling that Ibn Khaldun, immediately after talking about how bad philosophy and alchemy are, he switches to a, a discussing how you should arrange your writing when you're introducing a new science. It seems to signal that there was a reason for him making these arguments in that particular point in his book. So I'm proposing a kind of a complicated reading of that text. So why should he, uh, stepping back, why should he connect the occult sciences to prophecy? I'm just going to speculate about this and propose a couple of uh, answers. First of all, if they're not scientific, then they're not really going to be useful for his new science of, of history. And he wants to have a science that understands, you saw his reference to climate and other important scientific ty types of influences. He wants to understand why things happen in history. And uh, I think it's easy for him to exclude uh, divination, soothsaying, and fortune telling. Uh, from the uh, methods to understand what are the causes of historical events. Um, secondly, he's already told us at the uh, beginning of his uh, preliminary discourses that philosophical arguments that try to say that prophecy we know must exist according to reason, he doesn't like that. Uh, this was a view of a number of philosophers and theological schools that it is logically necessary that uh, God should send prophets to humanity. Uh, he doesn't buy that in this, in this presentation, and he says that uh, the authority of tradition is sufficient and God is not uh, constrained by any kind of uh, laws of reason. Um, that's on the overt level. Uh, and then he does stick with a few of the uh, occult arts of the ancients in the intellectual sciences, for historical reasons, because the examples that he quotes go back to the Greeks and, and the, uh, the ancients. So the, the form of divination that he calls Zairaja uh, is ascribed to Aristotle and uh, Alexander the Great as a way of determining what's going to happen in your battles uh, by certain kinds of divination. So those are a few thoughts about why he's organized it that way. So let's turn to Shamsuddin Muhammad al-Amuli, uh, who wrote his work a little earlier, about 1338, in Shiraz. Uh, he was a Persian. He was uh, a physician. 
and had commented on the medical work of Ibn Sina. He was also a Shi'i and uh, was familiar with some of the leading theologians of the age, including the famous uh, Alamaya Hilli, who was a very prominent theologian of the time. And uh, Amali had an important position at the Sultania Madrasa that was sponsored by one of the Mughal, sorry, the Mongol uh, emperors of the time, the Ilkhanid ruler Uljai II. So his book, which is called Nafais al Funun, or I translate that as Rare Sciences, was written for students of the academies of the madrasa as a kind of a comprehensive encyclopedia of the entire curriculum of knowledge. And he, like Ibn Khaldun, divides it into two parts. Uh, he has uh, 75 uh, sciences in the first section and 80, 80 sciences in the second section. Uh, it's a very sophisticated and well-informed work and uh, uh, is well worth a look if you're interested in some of these subjects. Uh, so the first of the two sections he calls the sciences of the Muslims or the moderns. And he divides it into four branches. First, literature, second, religious law, third, Sufism. Look how prominent it is there. And then what he calls the dialogical sciences, which have to do with history and uh, sec sectarian groups in Muslim history and the like. And then part two, he calls the sciences of the ancients. This corresponds to the uh, rational sciences of uh, Ibn Khaldun. And he talks about practical wisdom, uh, theoretical principles, mathematical principles. And then I've highlighted the branches of the natural sciences because that's where he puts the sciences of the hidden, the occult sciences. And then he concludes with the branches of mathematics where there's one uh, divination pra practice, geomancy, which is known in Arabic as Ramul. Now, Yes, so here's the way that the natural sciences look. Uh, the ones that are highlighted in red are the occult sciences. But look how they're sandwiched right next to alchemy and uh, veterinary and agricultural science. In other words, these are all placed in the same category as the natural sciences. And oddly, it concludes with a section on, uh, which is called the science of breath and imagination which turns out to be Indian yoga practices. I'll have a word to say about that as I conclude. So, why would he classify the occult knowledge as science? I gave some speculative reasons why Ibn Khaldun uh, put them under the category of prophecy. It seems to me that the domination of uh, rational argumentation in Shi'i theology might be one reason for this. If we look at the uh, principal theological work of uh, Hilli, which is uh, a strongly argued piece of philosophical uh, uh, reasoning, um, they're, they're not shying away from the notion of saying that prophecy, and in his case, the imamate, is necessary by reason. He's willing to assert that quite confidently, unlike uh, Ibn Khaldun, who took the sort of more uh, Sunni position of the Ashari school that we cannot constrain God by logic. Uh, but it also demonstrates the spread of a mathematical methodology uh, that was, uh, has been the subject of uh, some of our discussions uh, already in the conference, the uh, application of a rational uh, and mathematical methods to the occult sciences uh, make it arguably, you know, in terms of its approach and technique, a scientific activity. And it also testifies to the popularity of, of letter mysticism. It's interesting to see what modern scholars have to say about this, uh, this topic. I was looking at a biography of uh, Amoli by a, a Persian scholar who said that these occult topics have no value at all because in his view, they've been disproven and they're superstitious nonsense. Uh, but um, 
a uh, scholar named uh, Melvin Koshki, who's worked on these texts, uh, argues that this, this encyclopedia is a, an amazing intellectual achievement. And it, among other things, demonstrates that at this time, Sufism had risen to extraordinary prominence intellectually. And the uh, letter mysticism, uh, which was starting to spread throughout uh, uh, the Middle East, was uh, extraordinarily dominant in this in this work as well. So those are the sort of, uh, that's a quick overview of the way that these two uh, scholars classified the occult sciences. On the one hand, Ibn Khaldun puts it under the uh, subset of prophecy, where uh, Amali puts him into the natural sciences. Now, I want to take a look at one more case as an outlier, just to see how they deal with it. And this is the case of the yogis, the Indian uh, ascetics and uh, you might say wonder workers, uh, people who have unusual abilities and, and so forth. Ibn Khaldun has just one paragraph about them. He says, others such people are the men who train themselves in sorcery. They train themselves in these things in order to be able to behold the supernatural and to be active in the various worlds. Most such live in the intemperate zones of the north and south, especially in India, where they are called yogis. They possess a large literature on how such exercises are to be done. The stories about them in this connection are remarkable. His source is Ibn Battuta, the North African traveler who uh, spent all 30 years going around the world and uh, a long time in India where he was uh, serving as a judge for the Sultan of Delhi. Uh, he tells a number of really amazing stories about yogis that he encountered, including one who would uh, levitate in front of the Sultan. Now, um, you can take these stories as you will, uh, but what's interesting is Ibn Khaldun accepts the label of sorcery to classify these uh, yogis for their unusual abilities to go without food and water, to uh, hold their breath for long periods of time, and to accomplish other wondrous uh, feats uh, of knowledge. Uh, and at the same time, he talks about them as beholding the supernatural, and he places this paragraph into a section where he's talking about other modes of knowledge of the hidden, in particular those which are found among the Sufis who are seeking to experience the soul directly without the aid of the human body and its senses. So there's a kind of interesting ambiguity about the way the yogis are placed here. Uh, that is sorcery on the one hand, but also perhaps some kind of genuine encounter with the spiritual world. Amoli describes the yogis in terms of the faculty of imagination, and he uses the word waham. And uh, ascetic practice. In other words, uh, that by performing acts of uh, self-denial and extreme uh, physical deprivation, one can attain abilities, knowledge, and power that are extraordinary. Uh, and he actually presents uh, around five pages in translation, uh, in, it's a Persian translation of a yogic text about the powers of the breath and uh, summoning uh, spirits. Uh, now you might classify this as magic or you might classify it as something else. But uh, at the end, he's not too enthusiastic about it. And he says, since no useful purpose could be served by any further discussion of the subject, we will now leave it and move on. So 
these are two examples of how scholars will uh, react to an unusual phenomenon that has to fit into one category or another, and you have to decide uh, where to place it. And so uh, it's always interesting to look at the examples that come from, from the edge and are not easy to explain otherwise to see how they would be dealt with. So let's wind up. My conclusion is that classification of knowledge of the hidden depends on the context and the objective. With Ibn Khaldun, as we saw, the hidden was a subset of prophecy. And I think this can best be explained in terms of his project, the, the new science of history. Uh, this allowed him to consign the uh, occult sciences to a, a realm that was not part of the scientific curriculum per se, and therefore he could solidify his project of focusing on what he thought were the, the reliable sources for understanding the causes of history. I still think there's something quite uh, extraordinary going on in, in the new science, because if you can understand the causes of historical events, in particular, the cause of the rise and fall of empires, you can start a new empire of your own. So this is not a theoretical enterprise that is completely isolated from reality. With Amoli, the hidden as part of the natural sciences, I think this is more straightforward. It's a systematic application of uh, rational means to implement a curriculum of knowledge which was in place in the uh, institutions where he worked, where theology, uh, on the one hand, as well as the rational sciences, including astronomy and medicine and the like, were uh, highly developed, and the mathematical approach uh, was uh, highly cultivated. So in short, when we ask a question about how to understand the hidden sciences of the occult, the beyond, the supernormal. How do we classify it? It depends entirely on the project of the scholar who is doing so. Thank you. <laughs>